All right, so today we are going to, um, we're going to have another lesson about prayer. I told you last week that the month of uh, May would be about prayer, and we're dismissing our kids to kids' church. So any of you kids that are sixth grade down to three years old, if you want to go to kids' church, we'd be happy to have you in kids' church. All right, so here we go. Let me tell you, that if you read your bulletin, you'll see it, but um, we're going to divide the kids from... Um, three years old up through the second grade and then third grade up through the sixth grade So we recruited some other people to help in that so we can divide them up into two age groups and so um, I think that'll be better for them and uh, we'll get that more organized as we go along But what a great opportunity to minister to these kids. Okay, so we're going to talk about prayer today We're talking about two kinds of prayer private prayer and public prayer and they are, they are distinctly different. The guidelines for them are different. What Jesus said about it is different. And so we're going to look at that today and see if we can improve our prayer life, both privately and publicly. And we're going to start in Matthew chapter 6. We're going to read the first part of verse 5 and the first part of verse 7. Because this gives the stark contrast between the two kinds of prayer that he talks about in this little lesson on prayer that Jesus gave his first century Jewish disciples. First, he said this in verse 5, when thou prayest. Now, you, you immediately recognize that's from the King James Bible, right? When thou prayest. Prayest. Now, there's a reason. There is sometimes method behind, the, or ma yeah, method behind the madness, and there is today. Here's why I'm reading out of King James. You'll see this as we go along. When thou prayest, and then when he gets down into verse 7, he says, when ye pray. So what's the difference between when thou prayest and when ye pray? We're going to look at that in this lesson today. But first, let's pray. Father, we confess that we are powerless to understand anything from your word without the teaching ministry of your Holy Spirit. So I pray that he will come today and be our teacher. He lives within each one of us, but Lord, may he assume the role of teacher today. That's what you said he would do. You said when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will teach you all things and remind you of everything that I have said. So Lord, we, we pray that that will be the case today and that we will be eager students of your word as your holy spirit teaches us i pray that in jesus name and for his sake and amen so during his sermon on the mount the only full-length sermon preached by jesus that we have recorded in scripture jesus taught some incredible principles to guide the prayer lives of his jewish disciples of the first century and many of those things are applicable to us who are non-jewish disciples in the 21st century one of the most notable insights to be gained from his uh, section of scripture um, is that our that our lord divides the prayers of his people into these two broad categories there are private prayers and there are public prayers Jesus used two different phrases to reveal this truth, and we just read them. In Matthew 6, verse 5, he said, when thou prayest, and then he said down in verse 7, when ye pray. Now, the reason I chose to use the King James Version um, for the text verses in this lesson is because that in that version, it's easy to see that Jesus used different personal pronouns when he taught about prayer. The personal pronouns thou in 1611 English and ye in 1611 English. He taught first about private prayer using singular pronouns thou. And then he taught about public prayer using plural pronouns. It's the word ye. In, in, in the modern English versions of Scripture, it's not as easy to see the difference because the second person singular pronoun and, in, in modern English and the second person personal pronoun are the same word, you. Isn't that true? I can be speaking to one person. I can say, would you do this? I can speaking, be speaking to a group of people and say, you need to know this. It's the same word, and we have to rely on the context to determine whether we're speaking to one person or a group of people, whether we're talking about a single individual or a plural group of individuals. And so it's difficult to see that in English, but in that 1611 English, it was easy to see it. And now, 
In the 1611 English, the singular personal pronoun, second person personal pronoun, was thou. And so when Jesus was teaching about private prayer, um, he used that pronoun. And, and when he did so, um, he, he was talking about just a private prayer when only the person praying and God are present. Just one individual, private prayer. And that's why he said, when thou prayest in verse 5 of Matthew chapter 6. On the other hand, in 1611 English, the plural second person personal pronoun was ye. So when Jesus was teaching about public prayer, when, when in addition to the person praying and God or uh, other people are also present, and, and when he did that, he said, when ye pray. You see that? Change in pronouns tells us he's changing what he's talking about. He's gone from one individual talking about their prayer to a group of individuals, public prayer, and then he teaches about that. So I want you to see how important it is to pay attention to every word in the scriptures. Every word. The simple difference between thou and ye makes all the difference in understanding the subject matter of this particular section of Scripture, whether it's private prayer or public prayer. Maybe that's why Jesus said in Matthew 4, 4, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. You have to pay attention to every word because if you don't, then you can miss some incredibly important information. So let's take a look at what Jesus said about these two kinds of prayer, private prayer and public prayer. We'll start with public prayer, or excuse me, with private prayer because that's what he started with. Uh, Jesus first taught on this issue of private prayer. And perhaps the reason that he did that is that unless we get our private prayer lives right, then we're in no condition to lead others in public prayer. Do you get that? If you're not praying the way you're supposed to be praying in private, then you're not going to be in a fit condition to lead other people in prayer publicly. And about private prayer, Jesus said this. It's verses 5 and 6 of Matthew chapter 6. He said, When thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets, that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet, and when thou hast shut thy door, pray to thy Father which is in secret, and thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. Now these verses obviously deal with private prayer, or what we might call closet prayer where you go into your closet and there's no one there but you and God. The bottom line offered by Jesus regarding private prayer is that it is necessary. He didn't say, if thou prayest. He said, when thou prayest. Meaning he is taking for granted that those first century Jewish disciples understood the necessity of private prayer. And you're going to do it, so when you do it, abide by these instructions. Jesus also taught that his disciples should not do their private praying in a public setting. There are certain things that it's appropriate to pray for privately. There are other things that it's appropriate to pray for publicly, and you don't need to do your private praying in a public setting. Um, and, and especially if you're doing that to gain the admiration of bystanders. You want other people to see how how spiritual you are because you're praying. To do so makes your prayer life hypocritical. That's what Jesus said. He said, when thou prayest, talking about their private prayer, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are. And then he explains what he's talking about. For they love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corner of the streets that they may be seen of men. So what's he saying there? Don't do your private praying in a public setting so that other people can see you and applaud you and think how spiritual you are. He said, verily I say unto you, they have their reward. <laughs> get that? That's all they're going to get. If, if, if they did it to be seen of men and to get the approval and the applause of men, then they may get that, but that's all they're going to get. They have their reward. 
reward. But thou, and, and look, thou is singular. And so he says, thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet. Uh, you, you see, that's obviously private prayer because you're doing it in a closet. You're not doing it on a street corner. And when you do your private praying, go to a private place and do business between you and God. And it doesn't make any difference whether anybody else knows about it or not, but you and God. That's the issue. Now, these two verses use that second person singular personal pronoun. And again, in the 1611 King James Bible, it's translated thou. The use of this singular pronoun illustrates that these instructions are related to private prayer. Prayer sessions when only you and God are there. The private nature of this kind of prayer is emphasized by the guidelines that Jesus gave. Notice the guidelines in verse 6. When thou prayest, enter into thy closet. Is that a private place or a public place? That's pretty private, isn't it? And when thou hast shut thy door. That's pretty private, isn't it? When you shut the door. That, then pray to your Father which is in secret. So it's just you and God there having a secret conversation. And thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. This obviously is private prayer because it would be rather difficult for your public prayer to be done in secret in the closet with the door shut. This is private prayer. And Jesus wants us to have a powerful private prayer life. There are some things that you need to pray about that only you and God are privy to. Nobody else needs to know about it. It's private, personal kind of prayer. And that's obviously necessary because Jesus not only told him to do it, but he gave him some guidelines on how to do it. And then there's public prayer. The next verses deal with public prayer. And we know that that's the case because Jesus changed the pronoun he used in the previous verses. He, he switches pronouns. At this point, he began to use the second person plural personal pronoun. The use of this plural pronoun illustrates that these instructions are related to public prayer, prayer sessions when other people in addition to you and God are present. These instructions are guidelines for group prayer sessions. We've already had that today, haven't we, in this room? Kyle led us in a group prayer, a public prayer. I led you in a public prayer. Uh, after a while, we'll have an offering prayer, and uh, John will lead us in that, in that public prayer. But... Uh, and then it's okay to do that. We need to have public prayer where we pray together. And that's what he's talking about in this session, in this section, uh, verses 7 and 8. Jesus said, but when ye pray, again, plural, uh, use not vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. Be not ye, therefore, like unto them. For your father knoweth what things ye have need of before ye ask him. So, so let's take those verses and examine the guidelines that Jesus gives regarding this issue of public prayer. Number one, Jesus said, use not vain repetitions. This means that when we lead in public prayer, we should not use meaningless repetitions of words or phrases and religious sounding cliches just repeating the same thing over and over again. When we pray, God hears us the first time. So it is not necessary to repeat the same sentence over and over again in the same prayer to somehow think we're going to get God's attention. This prayer is more serious if we say this same thing over and over again. This also eliminates the use of memorized prayers that are recited over and over again each time that we're called on to pray publicly. The best thing to do in prayer is to simply use your natural, ordinary language to tell God what's on your mind and ask him to do whatever he wants to do about it. Do you get that? It does not need to be vain repetitions. Can I, can I tell you a story about a vain repetition? Back when I was 19 years old, a church down in South Arkansas invited me to be their pastor, as insane as that was, but they did. They invited me to be their pastor. 
Uh, right after I started pastoring that church, Miss Jenny and I got married, and I brought my bride to church one Sunday. And so our two kids were born while we were serving at that church. Anyway, um, and it was a, it was a, a, a one-pastor kind of small-town church no staff or anything like that and so the pastor wore many hats and one of the hats that I wore was not only pastor of the church but also youth leader and so there were 10 or 12 teenagers in that church and and so in the youth groups I started teaching them about prayer and and I wanted them to learn to be comfortable with not only praying privately but praying publicly and so I told them I said now <clears throat> sometime during the next couple of weeks, I'm going to call on one of you to lead in, in our prayer at church, in the opening prayer at church. And so they were all, you know, trying to get ready for that because they didn't know who it was going to be. And so that Sunday rolled around, and I called on this boy named Terry McDaniel. He was about 14 or 15 years old at the time. I called on him to lead the prayer. Well, Terry had been in that church since birth. I mean, the Sunday after he was born, his mom and dad were there in church. He'd been in that church his whole life. And there was this older brother in the church, and that fellow was called on to pray from time to time. And whenever he prayed, he prayed the same prayer every time. And so Terry grew up here in this man's prayer. Same words, same voice inflections, same pauses, same everything. It was just his prayer. And so when I called on Terry to lead in prayer that day, just because he was a little bit ornery, he prayed that man's prayer. Word for word, voice inflections, pauses, the whole deal. It was quite meaningless. <laughs> Other than all over the congregation, I could see people doing this sitting in their pews. <laughs> Everybody in the crowd knew that he had just prayed that man's prayer. Do you get that? That's the kind of stuff that he's talking about here. No vain repetitions because it becomes empty. It becomes meaningless when you just say the same thing over and over again as if it is a piece of poetry to be recited rather than a heartfelt conversation that you're having with the Father. And so we need to understand that. No vain repetitions when it comes to public prayer. Just tell God what's on your heart. And then just ask God to do what he wants to do about it. Then here's another thing that I've noticed that I think is a little odd. You only see this happen in churches. Churches in America. Um, because for so many generations, the King James Bible was about the only English Bible that was popular and that people used in the churches. Um, some people learned to speak King James. You know, that's a language all to itself, right? You know, with the these and the thous and the ESTs on the ends of the words, you know, and all of that. And some people learn to speak that because they've been in church their whole life hearing, hearing the scripture read from that Bible. And some people, you've probably heard this, they talk just as normal as you and me with, with, with the lazy kind of American English that we speak unless they're praying publicly. And then they jettison back in time to 1611 and they pray in King James English. How many of you have heard people do that? They do that. Why would we do that? Is that a special language? Is, is it that God's going to pay more attention if we're speaking 1611 King James English? Not at all. We just need to, from our hearts, communicate to God in a language that's natural to us. And, and, and listen, God understands all the languages. He understands King James better than we do. But he also understands the kind of English that we speak today because God listens to our hearts, not just our words. And so we need to understand that. That's, that's just another one of those weird things that we sometimes do in prayer that's not necessary. And the danger with that one is that if somebody's um, not been a Christian all that long, and especially if they weren't um, in their Christian experience, if they weren't around when the King James Bible was being used a lot, then they might feel like they can't pray because they can't pray like that guy does. You see how that can become a hindrance? So we just need to pray. We just need to talk to God in the language that we use every day. And so we need to get that. No vain repetitions. And then, and then I want you to get this. Uh, Jesus indicated when he said this, they, that's the heathen, so using vain repetitions... He said, don't do that like the heathen do. 
Jesus considers it heathenish for us to use vain repetitions when we pray. He said that's what the heathens do. What's a heathen? It's an unbeliever. Uh, somebody that may be mixed up in a false religion. He says don't do that. Don't do what they do. And, and then he said they, that's the heathen, think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. What, what is much speaking? Long. A lot. So what's the implication there? You don't have to pray a long prayer when you're leading in public prayer. There was another guy in that same church that, that Jenny and I were at when our kids were being born and we were very young. And, and, and I did not know this because I was a new pastor and, and I asked the deacons, who are some people that will lead in public prayer? And they gave me a list because I didn't want to call on somebody that wasn't comfortable doing that. And so they gave me a list. And, and so I just started going down through the list and calling on people to pray at different times in the services. And, and there was this one guy, every time I called on him to pray, you could just hear people go, oh, because it was going to be a long, long prayer. What does this say? Is it necessary to engage in much speaking when you're leading in a public prayer? No, he says, don't be like the heathen because that's what they do. This indicates that, that Jesus views long public prayers as heathenish. Long prayers are appropriate in your prayer closet, but not in a public setting. In, in the following verses, Jesus offered an example of a well-crafted public prayer. The, the verses right after his giving this uh, instruction on prayer, he gave us what we commonly call the Lord's Prayer or the model prayer. It was a prayer that he gave to teach these first century Jewish disciples how to pray. And even though everything in the prayer is not directly applicable to us today, um, a lot of it is, and, and the whole issue that it is a brief public prayer is applicable to us today because much speaking is heathenish. Look at what he says. If you read this prayer slowly and deliberately, it'll take you somewhere between 30 and 45 seconds. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. And then he closed with the word amen. You see, the indication is that public prayers should be very brief and to the point. You don't have to go on and on and on. God already knows what you need. He already knows what you're going to ask before you ever ask him. So it's not important that you go into a lot of detail explaining everything to God and trying to tell him why he should do what you're asking him to do. Just tell him what's going on and ask him to do what he wants to do about it. Here's another one. As Jesus continued this instruction, he said that in, in verse 8. Your father knoweth what things you have need of before you ask him. So, so here's the question. If, if, if God knows what we need before we ask him, is it necessary to go into a lot of detail when you're wording a public prayer? Do you have to explain to God what's going on? Do you have to fill God in as if he doesn't know? He knows everything from the beginning to the end. We simply need to get to the point, tell God what it is that we're concerned about and ask him to do what he wants to do about it. If God knows what we need before we ask, then why is it even necessary to ask? And the answer is that asking God is God's prescribed way for his people to receive. When we ask God for, to do what needs to be done, when we ask God to step into this situation and do whatever he knows is best to do, then that teaches us dependence upon him. That we don't have to solve the problem ourselves. that God is the one who's in control, and we can depend on him to solve the problem, to meet the need, to correct the situation. And so he wants us to ask. In fact, Jesus said it like this in Matthew chapter 7, verse number 7, and then in verse 8. He said, ask, and it shall be given you. What's he saying? 
His prescribed way of receiving is asking. So ask and it shall be given you. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. For every one that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth, and to him that knocketh it shall be opened. So what's he saying? Pray and God will move. It doesn't have to be a long, flowery public prayer. Just tell God what your concerns are and ask him to do something about it, and he will. Failure to ask means failure to receive. You say, my Scott, not doing anything about this. Have you asked him to? And, oh, yeah, I did. I, I, I told God what was going on, and I asked him to do this and this and this. And what you've done is you've asked him to do what you think he ought to do. You think God's impressed? When we ask him to do what we think he ought to do? Because most of the time, what we think he ought to do is far different than what he knows he ought to do. Because his ways are not our ways, his thoughts are not our thoughts, saith the Lord. So what we need to do is just tell God what our concerns are and then ask him to do what he knows needs to be done. You, you get an answer to that kind of prayer. J James wrote this in James 4 too. You have not. Why? Because you ask not. So if we don't have the answer to a prayer, it's because we haven't asked God to do what he wants to do about it. We might have asked him to do something different than what he wants to do about it. But we need to ask him to just do what he wants to do. Isn't that the way we're supposed to pray? Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. You know, if you listen to most of us pray, and I have to put myself in this category too, we really need to rewrite that. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, my will be done on earth as it is in heaven. But is that what it says? Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And so we just need to ask God to do what God wants to do. And we don't always know what that is, do we? And when we don't know what that is, it's just safe to say, God, I don't know what you need to do in this situation, but please do something. Do what you know needs to be done. Didn't Paul tell the Romans that? We don't know what to pray as we ought, but his spirit makes intercession for us with groans that can't even be put into words, groanings that cannot be uttered. So it, it's not necessary for you to be able to figure out everything that God needs to do. But it is necessary for you to ask God to do what he wants to do in any given situation. So here's the conclusion. One of the central themes of our prayers, whether it's public or private, should be that unbelievers hear the Jesus story, believe it, and receive eternal life. That should be one of the central themes of our prayer. Why would I say that? It's because of what Peter wrote in 2 Peter 3, verse number 9. Some excerpts from that verse. Peter said this, The Lord is not willing or is not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. So what does Peter say there under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit? God wants everyone to be saved. That is a foundational principle all through the New Testament. God wants everyone to be saved. Will everyone be saved? No. Some people will choose not to believe God. But God wants everyone to be saved. And if we're supposed to pray according to his will, then we should be praying that people will be saved. That routinely, consistently, ongoing, people will be confronted with the Jesus story, believe it, and then call out to God to receive the incredible gift of eternal life. That should be a central theme of our prayer life. If you're not praying for that, you're not praying the way God wants you to pray. Peter said it like that. And so... The only way, the only way to avoid perishing, that's what he said, God does not want anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. So in short, Jesus does not want anybody to perish. 
He didn't want anybody to die and go to hell. And the only way to avoid perishing, the only way to avoid dying and going to hell is to believe the Jesus story. That's what he said in John 3, 16. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him, that means to believe this Jesus story as it is recorded in the Bible, it doesn't mean that you make up your own Jesus based on what you heard grandma say. It means that you have read the book, you understand who God says in his word, this Jesus is and what he's done. You believe that Jesus story as it's recorded in the Bible. If you believe it, you understand it. And then he says, they shall not perish. So what does it take to avoid perishing, to, to avoid dying and going to hell? You got to know and believe this story because you see, you can't, you can't believe something you don't know. You can't believe something you don't understand. Once you know it, once you understand it, you can choose to believe it. Then you're in a position to get eternal life. Because he says that, that if they do that, that they, they shall not perish but have eternal life. That's his goal. And, and you know, since there may be someone here today who has never heard and believed the story, never been able to hear it clearly enough and explain simply enough that they, could, that they could connect all the dots and believe it and then call on Jesus to get eternal life. Since there may be somebody here today in that particular situation, then I want to tell this story one more time.